Welcome to MedEvidence, where we help you navigate the truth behind medical research with unbiased, evidence-proven facts. Hosted by cardiologist and top medical researcher, Dr. Michael Corrin. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Corrin, and we have a really special guest today for our MedEvidence podcast. I want to introduce everybody to Dr. Itai Dayan, who is a, a physician a data scientist and somebody who has published a very important paper about the use of artificial intelligence in medicine. And Dr. Dion and I are going to have a conversation about the use of AI in medicine. And I want to learn more about this because um, I'm both really excited about AI, but also an incredible AI skeptic at the same time. So I want you to kind of get me clear on what I can expect and what I shouldn't expect, and also have our listeners and viewers be able to understand what's a reasonable expectation, what uh, may not happen in any time soon, and why we shouldn't be fearful of artificial intelligence in medicine. So with that, uh, Dr. John, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about your background. Hello, everyone, and uh, Dr. Cohen, thank you for inviting me today. Um, and my background started from uh, clinical medicine, worked in emergency medicine for a period of time, uh, as well as completed uh, research in neuroimmunology and some uh, additional rotations. Uh, I later on went to work with Boston Consulting Group's uh, healthcare practice, consulting to pharma companies, provider pay organizations, mainly on topics of uh, digital transformation and harnessing analytics into uh, the business processes. I later on went to work for Mass General Brigham, where I led the development and deployment of uh, AI solutions into the clinical workflow and uh, together with uh, commercialization partners through FDA approvals and the likes. Uh, also uh, started developing the um, uh, model validation capabilities and launched kind of academic uh, based uh, CRO for ensuring that only the best models go to market with the best corpus of evidence. Um, in my struggles to find data and collaboration across healthcare systems, I've identified the need for a common data processing platform for uh, medical institutions. Uh, one of the key enabling technologies of that would have been uh, something that keeps data local and doesn't require you to transfer, consolidate, share data. The key enabler technology for that is federated learning, the topic which I uh, published on, in, uh, including in Nature Medicine in 2021, which uh, I think you're, you're referring to that uh, paper most likely. Yeah, very, very impressive paper. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, that was the kind of origin story of my company, which is the taking that federated learning concept and turning that into a multi-cloud hybrid data computation platform with specialization in the healthcare and life sciences vertical. Okay. And with the attempt of uh, bridging data silos in getting more data, more diverse data, and better evidence in the development and deployment of AI and analytics products. Beautiful. Well, very impressive background. And again, thanks for joining this episode of MedEvidence. So just get, get us familiar with just some of the terminology. I think people kind of get confused, including myself, quite frankly. Uh, so we, we talk about digital transformation. Um, we, we've had computers and software and medicine for you know, decades at this point. I remember I did my uh, third year medicine clerkship at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And it was the first hospital in the Boston area to have a computer system. And at that time, what the computer system did was show you what the lab values were for the patients. Whereas uh, when I did my surgical clerkship at Mass General, I had to walk up to the lab and get this, this sheet of paper that came off of some rickety printer that had the, the, the lab values for my patients. So you know, that was the early stages of, of digitalizing medicine. But you know, that's different than what we're talking about now, and it's different than some other software initiatives, and I think it's different than AI. So help people understand those distinctions. So uh, health IT has already become pretty mainstay in, in uh, the healthcare world with America taking a leadership position in that through the Meaningful Use uh, Act and 
additional modernization efforts. And I think that's kind of like a big part of that. Uh, as part of the health IT evolution, there's uh, more integrated systems and ability to source data in more um, kind of like common ways. Uh, I think analytics and the, the algorithmic decision make, making in medicine is not something new. And every person who's ever used a cell counter in a hematology lab or any IVDs have been using the kind of data products for a very long period of time. Uh, there is today an, a further uh, transformation of the field, or at least the beginning of a transformation of the field, with having the ability to um, analyze unstructured data in a in making more granular this granular understanding of it and making better decisions based on that uh which some of them is as easy as in, uh, introducing uh, algorithm algorithms with multiple data inputs and kind of like multi from multivariate logistic regressions into decision making some of them go into a neural network and now with gen ai and other things of that nature um, a lot of the buzz in the industry has been around the enabling technologies that allow that, and everybody's talking about kind of a uh, GPT, Gemini, GPU processors, platforms, and all sorts of stuff of that nature. I think the translational efforts of many of these technologies into the healthcare workflow are still fairly early. Um, and I think that by itself is creating kind of a lot of interest and excitement in, med in the medical world. Uh, also a lot of kind of a Luddite approach to this in, in some cases. One of the things that amused me after publishing uh, my paper on natural medicine was seeing how many papers there are that say federated learning will not cure the data diversity problems. Yeah. AI is not a silver bullet. And some of these technologies have barely gotten into play. Mm, sure. <laughs> and already it was kind of like a strong rejection of many of them. Interesting, yeah. Um, I think there's a need to increase the translational research and also modernize a lot of the translational research into AI. Mm -hmm. And there's also a need to evolve regulatory frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas today, kind of a urinary, urinary catheter and software as medical device are regulated differently, but not kind of like hugely differently. Mm -hmm. right. Many thoughts have been shared in the field and some more, I believe, will be implemented in the upcoming years. Right. Yeah, so, so you, it's interesting when you talk about the controversies. What we like to say here at MedEvidence is that we, we have the disease of objective, uh, I should say pathological objectivity, that we have that disease, pathological objectivity. And we also have relentless skepticism that we use to pound out the truth. So uh, I think that's an important part of what we do in clinical research is ask questions, be skeptical. And then if our theories hold up to that skepticism, then we can be confident that they're reflecting a truth. They're reflecting something that's reliable for taking care of our patients ultimately and for improving lives. So it's, uh, it's an interesting process when you get into it. But so let's, let's get into a little bit more sort of concrete examples. Is there something that comes to mind that you think is a success to date of artificial intelligence in medicine that you want to share with the with listeners? So first of all, in the research world, there's many successes and many proofs that a machine eye can interrogate things better than a human eye, and many things can be uh, predicted in kind of high, high degrees of uh, accuracy. Uh, and I think, you know, nature and science and nature medicine and all the good papers show kind of like every month new things. In terms of translating that into viable clinical products, we've seen some early successes in radiology operations. And I'd call that radiology operations to a large extent because it's not always diagnosis and treatment, but rather kind of triaging cases and improving workflow efficiencies. But I think we have seen some like notable uh, results there. I think we've seen quite a lot of uh, pharma R&D successes in which uh, there's new biomarkers and new diagnostics, uh, companion diagnostics brought into uh, studies. Um, 
in many kind of like valuable uh, disciplines. Um, I'm seeing, and, and we've seen a ton of uh, automation in hospital operations in terms of uh, reducing their uh, kind of like processing of red tape, transcriptions, um, and things all around that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't think I've seen many cases of successful multimodal data fusion for making step change in decision making in in oncology tumor board, for example. Mm-hmm. And was definitely some uh, lagging behind it, those of, again, translating some of the findings. Um, but I think we're trending into that direction. I, I think it's, it's, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think we're seeing in the industry side kind of a bit in um, a bit of a reset in terms of expectations from new companies coming uh, spinning out um, in regards to what what are we actually going to achieve um, in short order and so I'm more, more focused on tooling and the uh, infrastructure enablers. Uh, rather than kind of like rush ahead into diagnosing cancer. Um, I also think there's more of a realization that uh, the transformation of a medical practice will come from inside medicine and academia. So Uh, how about the flip side? It's always important for us to talk about the disasters. Have there been any uh, AI disasters that affected medicine that were, were part of learning? Again, we're not here to point fingers, but just... When we make mistakes, we need to learn from our mistakes. And what I like to say is that the secret of success is not not making mistakes. The secret of success is recovering from your mistakes as quickly as possible. So I'm curious um, if there's anything that jumps to your mind from that standpoint. So largely communicated catastrophes, I I don't believe there have been many uh, of. I think we've seen cases where models, AI diagnostic models have gone out to market and have seen a substantial dip in performance leading to many false positives and kind of like, uh, you know, doctors uh, being alerted too many times. Not that dissimilar with kind of uh, patient monitoring uh, devices from a previous generation. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also seen, not necessarily in the clinical workflow as much, but in the payer provider engagements, many models that... uh, could even be rule-based systems that have uh, denied care from patients based on lack of a kind of deep understanding of the patient population or implementing model designs that uh, may have been discriminatory or seen as discriminatory towards certain populations due to innate population characteristics. Um, so there, I think there have been there some lawsuits. I, I, I think this isn't like not the best topic to go into deeply because I'm not a big expert. Yeah, 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 we don't. Um, and how about this concept of AI hallucinating? We've we've heard about that. Is that something that you've had to deal with, or is that something we should be fearful of in medicine, or you think it's a small issue? That's an excellent question. Uh, clinicians themselves hallucinate and make wrong decisions. <laughs> and I think, it, I think it's important to consider that because we're, we're much more um, accepting human error than machine error here. And that by itself is something that I think is worth a discussion. But um, gen- generative AI models, which you're referring to, do indeed hallucinate and say a lot of nonsense. But some nonsense is often driven by the kind of data that was used in order to uh, train, quote unquote, and uh, prepare them. Uh, the level of impact this would have would be dependent on how integrated into a clinical workflow some of these solutions will be. Uh, right now, for example, they are not deeply integrated. Uh, Our doctors around the world asking kind of a a generative AI questions and getting the silly answer and maybe actioning on that. That might be, but I'm not familiar enough with it. I would say that um, I I don't think that any of the kind of uh, public uh, broad models today are anywhere close to be a one-stop shop for clinical decision-making. 
And uh, in, in many of these cases, there will be need to actually package an entire product around this, add guardrails, do ongoing validation and monitoring, and things that are very different from the Silicon Valley kind of um, way, way, way of thinking about R&D and product maintenance. And so I, I, I suspect we're still a year out from the point in which this will become like a big deal. Uh, I know there's a lot of transcription and kind of um, they, uh, processing, uh, like textual processing stuff. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with the performance and some of these are fairly early products. Um, so it's, it's, it's a bit tough to say. Sure. Uh, at the end of the day, um, I, I don't think we're going to easily get to a point where a doctor doesn't need to at all take a glance at notes or not need to at all kind of like sign off on things. I think that will remain an, an, an issue that will be you know required uh, for the time being and probably even the future. I, I would put on the flip side of this that Today, there's a lot of like uh, lack of care provided due to lack of automation. And I've seen in cases where we had like stroke networks, for example, in uh, second world countries or countries which aren't the US and others, where it's kind of like, do you prefer waiting for two weeks to get something uh, evaluated or would you like a bot to review your imaging study <laughs> and maybe make mistakes? Right, right. So, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is that gets into the question of who is these products targeted to? Is it do you see it ultimately as consumer targeted? Is it is it healthcare provider targeted, or is it institutional targeted, or maybe some combination thereof? And is there one customer that may ultimately uh, prevail as the one that's the the driving force in AI development in medicine? So, so, so you mean one customer? Or one what type of customer? In other words, is there going to be, um, you know, some big high tech firm that offers uh, an AI bot that you can you can own for hundred dollars a month with your your cable subscription, and you can ask this uh, bot questions and have you know AI evaluate is this something you need to go to the emergency room for or something that uh, that can wait or maybe even suggest a home remedy. I'll, I'll, I'll make the uh, approximation of that to the exciting world of medical devices and say that I am highly skeptical about that scenario. Okay. So be more institutional and, and provider-based. I mean, the, you, you might say that either this becomes kind of a mid-device-like field when you have a lot of small uh, companies and uh, you know competing with each other and none of them gaining huge scale. Uh, you might have a player who knows how to create highly customizable products, uh, kind of like an open AI or Google Cloud kind of character, who then gets uh, into clinical workflows and the doctors kind of like contributes to the corpus of knowledge of it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It seems to me highly unlikely. Uh, given the regu regulatory issues around that, and I... I'd, I'd see this more as ultimately uh, something that doctors use specific, like the evolution is the doctors using specific tools, um, customizing the tools for themselves. And it could be that within in the next generation, uh, some of these tools become so sophisticated and some of these like uh, technology capabilities become so um, commodity that there will just be a few big players who provide similar products in a competitive market. Um, the, the, the difficulty of adjusting uh, these kind of uh, AI devices to different workflows in different locations under different guidelines and medical practice behaviors is very, seems very tricky. Yeah. Uh, at MGH, for example, we, we tried to collaborate with the European uh, institutions because we were kind of a, and they were as well, powerhouses of building AI algorithms in kind of a grant funded environment. Mm -hmm. And um, we found that many of 
the problems that interested large, very large academic medical centers in America interested nobody else uh, because large institutions in America have scale. Right. The clinical triage workflow are like very exciting to them, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like practical business problems. Uh, many places outside have much smaller workflows, uh, have lower degree of specialization, have lower degree of realizing operational uh, wins from implementing AI, etc. And it just showed to me that ultimately the, the market will not be conquered by kind of like the 50 leading algorithms that will be conquered by thousands of algorithms with different optimizations for different problems and questions, etc. That kind of like moves all discussion to the platform level. Right. So I don't, opportunities for small companies, right? I think, I think the, the world is going into small companies. Innovation is running very quickly. Large companies are incapable of uh, kind of identifying all the right or aren't interested in identifying all the right kind of like small nuggets. Uh, when we ourselves work with big companies, one of the reasons we work with large kind of technology partners like NVIDIA and Google Cloud and also an Amazon instance and kind of like others uh, is because these companies don't want to yet put on all their eggs in that basket. Sure. So that's, how, that's how the venture world works. Sure. And that's how scale up uh, uh, you know, works. Pharma companies are very, I, I think, even maybe a bit unusual on the market uh, in that regard right. of making kind of like massive bets on uh, at times on earlier assets. And even then, the small biotechs and virtual biotechs and uh, kind of like flourishing of specialized CROs and all that are all a sign of kind of like faster innovation going to market and that needs to be de-risked in a more um, cost-effective and uh, adequate way. Telling us about your company, uh, what the vision is for your company, and then you can talk again about your great paper in Nature Medicine and how that kind of fuels what you're doing on the entrepreneurial side at this point. Perfect. So in um, the midst of the COVID pandemic, we developed at uh, Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School an algorithm that could uh, predict with a fairly high degree of accuracy which patients would require mechanical ventilation, which patients would require some form of oxygen supplementation. Which with patients COVID. These are have... COVID patients, right? Yes, yes. And... Uh, we were looking for a way to disseminate this algorithm to additional medical centers. It was clear that uh, other medical centers would not trust an algorithm that hasn't gone through some step of validation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they the, had the option of going to the FDA or getting an emergency use, use authorization, which seemed impractical. Mm-hmm. And we decided to take a federated learning approach in order to retrain and test the algorithm on a large number of medical institutions. So explain to people that terminology, federated learning. So federated learning is a way to train algorithms uh, on disparate data sets without needing to exchange data. The technology itself is based on running training tasks of AI models uh, of different versions of AI model in the different uh, locations, merging of the parameters of a model in a central orchestrator and then updating the models uh, that sit within the data sets in order to ultimately generate a globally optimized model. So you have, you have a learning model and you add another institution and then how does that get into the learning model and how does it train the model? Maybe that might help people understand a little bit better. If, if I'd give a really kind of like intuitive and a bit simplified version, I'd say that if you have a linear uh, curve that says y equals a times x plus b, okay. <laughs> then, in, then instead of centralizing all the x's and all the y's and then putting one scatter plot and kind of running a line, mm-hmm. you only show the a's and the b's of the, of the function and use them in order to deduce how an optimal curve would look like. Okay. Okay. So that, that's kind of the mathematics of it uh, simplified. Uh, but you're talking about this concept of data sharing and the sort of the, the guardrails around that and the sensibilities around that. So tell us how that fits into this process. 
Absolutely. So in, in a learning, uh, in a federated learning collaboration, different parties can contribute their data for specific tasks without having to actually move the data outside their firewall, outside their ownership. Mm, okay. And so um, in the case of the exam study, which ultimately was published in Nature Medicine, uh, we, we were able to set up 20 medical institutions worldwide within less than two months. Nice. Because we eliminated the need to share data mm. and the federated computation engine we provided was a common platform for processing data in each one of these institutions. Okay, I understand. Yeah, interesting. So you kind of like solved an IT problem and solved the privacy and data sharing problem at mm. the same time by allowing the different uh, partners to um, approve a specific use case of their data and not having to diminish the control over their data. Got it. Yeah, so, so that's, that's super interesting. So let's get into some of the clinical practicality of it specific to the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the, the concerns early on in the pandemic and the learning that we needed to have happen in the beginning of the pandemic. So obviously when we first were dealing with COVID, the prognosis, particularly for older people, was horrible. And we had to make decisions about who was going to go into the ICU, who was going to be put on a ventilator, um, I remember I was in the hospital in, in active during these times, and there was one theory out there that maybe putting people on a ventilator early and, quote, resting the lungs was the best strategy to improve prognosis, but that turned out to be really, really wrong. So tell us a little bit about um, your computer model and how it, it helped us make these practical decisions about who goes to the ICU, who gets uh, this type of treatment or another. So the... The algorithm used to, to begin with, it uh, predicted a score, a continued score. So it wasn't a yes, no answer. That by itself helped testing its calibration and understanding, kind of like being able to compare cases side by side and defining specific cutoff for decision making, but without the need of kind of saying, oh, the bot said yes or the bot said no. That by itself was already uh, helpful. Second of all, the algorithm used um, data that was fairly objective, like lab data, vital signs, age, things that a clinician can discern using some uh, laboratory tests, some uh, physiological tests, and simple medical record examination, uh, and not uh, requiring clinical impression. Many of the algorithms around that time had a lot of clinical impressions in them that made the models very not generalizable. Uh, because they also depend, were very kind of like greater dependent. Um, in addition to that, we leveraged multimodal data and added an, an imaging study of a chest uh, x-ray. Mm -hmm. So some additional kick to the model. And uh, in addition, when you included a good number of different inputs, you created a more robust algorithm that was able to kind of like uh, sift through cases that otherwise you may have made the mistake with a high degree of variance and inaccuracy in it. Um, now, was the was the output something like um, likelihood of mortality or or likelihood of needing the ICU? Give us a little bit more flavor in terms of the the clinical output that the clinicians were able to see based on the learning. We, we optimized, so it provided a regret. It was a regression model. It provided a score from zero to one or one to one hundred, depends on how you sure. set it out. Sure. And we, imp we uh, applied the different cutoffs and different normalization to the entire score in order to, to discern patients who are mostly likely to remain on room air or be discharged, patients that would require low flow oxygen, patients that require high flow oxygen, mechanical ventilation, and death. Okay. So these were kind of like cutoffs. And the score, the scoring we had to give to the algorithm itself was based on a weighted average uh, area under the curve for making the, each, each one of these discriminations. Got it. And this, and this could happen, obviously, relatively early in the course of presentation. Um, and and that, I would imagine that's when it would have the most predictive value for a clinician. Uh, the model was uh, trained on data and tested on data that was captured in the emergency department 
allowed to have patients that uh, showed up with respiratory symptoms, okay. meaning somebody who was felt like they needed to be evaluated for a respiratory illness. Mm-hmm. So there was some selection in, in that regard. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. And any, uh, can you share with us how the institutions involved were able to deploy the data? Uh, you can give us some, some examples of you know, how it made a difference for these institutions. The model itself, by the time we completed the study uh, and so it was implemented, it was used uh, for population level uh, studies and uh, many institutions, I have not tracked each and every one of them, but some used it in kind of a prospective evaluation of the model um, with, a, with the intent of uh, implementing it. Um, the model itself well, it was an excellent test case of AI and an excellent test case of federated learning training. Uh, also required a lot of multimodal data, as I said, and it was not a trivial one to deploy. We ultimately did deploy that at uh, Mass General Hospital. Okay. And many feedback from ER staff or anything that's shareable at this point? I think I'd let the that's that's a bit late, later than the a bit later than the publication and me starting Rhino Health. I'd let the ER speak for themselves. All right, we'll let, we'll let them speak for themselves. Sounds great. So you mentioned Rhino Health. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, I'm I'm fascinated by that. So t- tell me um, where'd you get the name and um, uh, also you know what your hopes are with the company. So um, the study itself showed that the federated technology is very powerful and it moves the needle in terms of setting up collaborations, executing collaborations, bringing in more data, bringing in more diverse data and getting better algorithms. Mm-hmm. That was great. The sustainability of these kind of efforts was very questionable in the sense that you needed a lot of IT collaboration, you needed a lot of kind of like local collaborations, a lot of skill set in each institution. Uh, while the computation method of federated learning was already reasonably established and not still evolved quite a bit, the, the need for an edge compute based platform that would support a collaboration like that also became very clear. Edge compute in kind of like simple terms is the computation happens at the data source mm-hmm. and doesn't require kind of like centralizing uh, data. Um, Edge compute in this case allows you to create uh, multiple computation tasks, not just federated learning. It can be federated learning, it can be execution of a model, it can be data analysis, and can be many other things. Uh, Rhino Health is an edge compute based platform that allows the usage of different applications on data sets, including federated learning. Got it. Okay. And and a lot of the blueprint for defining the platform was influenced by the experience of publishing findings in a highly rigorous uh, paper such as Nature Medicine, which asked us a lot of questions on the underlying data, identifying sources of bias, being able to sustain ongoing access to that data in order to test this with external independent reviewers, right. the ability of expanding this collaboration into additional sites. And on, on and on and on, which uh, are not covered by kind of like federated learning per se. Right. And uh, that influenced a lot of our roadmap and how to build something that would be relevant to the medical world that's at large. Yeah. So for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with Nature Medicine, it's a, it's a very high p- impact, highly respected international medical journal. And if you get something published in that, you know the author had to go through a painstaking process of dealing with a lot of questions from the referees and the editors. And uh, I personally have gone through that process, so I can attest to the fact that getting that paper published was really, really impressive. So, again, congratulations. Now, getting back to the Rhino Health thing, t- tell me a little bit more about how you started the commercialization process. And, and again, I'm really curious about the name Rhino. Where, where, where does that come from? So uh, we started out by working with academic centers as uh, design partners uh, and enabled pushing several academic collaborations that were stuck due to data sharing issues, including with the National Cancer Institute and uh, and different NIH-sponsored efforts, a European consortia and others. 
we evolved from there into providing more commercial use cases, including with the biopharma industry, uh, professional societies such as the American College of Radiology, um, continuing deepening our relations with different uh, techno big tech companies, taking us even broader into a more global scale. Uh, today we have uh, around 50 uh, health organization nodes worldwide and we're growing quite quickly and I expect us to get beyond 100 by the end of this year. Uh, the name Rhino Health came from the need to find a name for the company that isn't already trademarked. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we liked the idea of the Rhino as a symbolism for breaking through obstacles, ah, okay. such as we saw kind of like data sharing and data silos as a serious obstacle. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, there's is, is, is this um, crazy statistics that rhinos are actually responsible for a lot of deaths in certain parts of the world because um, they can be fierce and unpredictable from what I understand. So hopefully you're a fierce company and hopefully you're taking something that's unpredictable and making it more predictable. I think that's a very <laughs> fine way of positioning that. Amen. So um, tell us what your uh, your sort of aspirations are for Rhino Health and who, are, who do you envision your customers are and what problems will your technology solve for these customers? Today, we've expanded from doing federated learning into doing a full stack of data activation from harmonizing data with a Gen AI powered co pilot, by the way, one of the low risk, high impact uses of Gen AI, into the data analytics, exposition, and uh, creating collaborative workflows between different institutions. Uh, and as such of that, we've kind of gone beyond the AI and into analytics, reporting, quality, and et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, with excellent partners and doing all of these. And we've always the intent of being kind of a platform enabler of existing medical needs. Uh, as we progress onward, we want to see ourselves as activating the data of more and more hospitals worldwide and enabling a new collaboration method, one that doesn't care about federated learning, doesn't care about edge compute, doesn't care about any of these, but needs to create a private, secure, and responsible sharing of data insights in order to promote uh, medicine and drive a transformation of practice. So give us an example of a customer, what type of customer you have, or if you can, a specific customer, and the kind of uh, question or problem they want you to address. We've ha we have customers that need to develop biomarkers for clinical studies based on biometric data, uh, which is a very big problem for secondary leverage. We have customers who are worried about the safety of AI and want to test it at scale in multiple institutions, but cannot centralize kind of like entire archives of each institution just to test a product on it and don't want to integrate each AI product one by one just in order to test it. Mm. Uh, that's a very prominent emerging need of kind of like a safety net for uh, AI users. Uh, we have customers using us for longitudinal patient uh, analyses uh, with data that remains tethered to the medical record. So you don't have a need of uh, kind of getting to a level of a uh, redaction in order to centralize it to a centralized cloud. We have customers working on outcome research in a way that allows uh, different hospitals to understand aggregated outcomes with a certainty that there's no kind of uh, discovery of the data in a way that we disagree with. So the ability to enforce a contract in that regard. Uh, we have customers who use us for uh, bringing Gen AI to the data since most hospitals, um, medical records and data warehouses are still on-prem or on private cloud and they are less interested in exposing it to public cloud APIs. Mm -hmm. We have customers looking to say, harmonize their data at scale into FireRAW 4, FireIL and, and OMOP 5.4 standards without just being kind of like a year-long process by using the GPTs and different uh, uh, Gen AI capabilities. So, as you can see, it's um, yeah, it's interesting. It's multi-purpose, and it allows you to do whatever kind of computation, analytics, and pipelines you do on centralized data without the need for centralizing data. Got it. But it's still uh, one of the things I'm gleaning. It's still mostly in the data analytic realm. It hasn't 
really transferred to the patient question realm quite yet or the um, clinical process dilemma question that a lot of institutions are dealing with? M much of it is we're also being used for hospitals to a certain quality of their actual workflows and optimize for workflows as part of data analytics. Okay. We're not a clinical workflow solution in the sense that you'd punch a number and Rhino will tell you what to do. Uh, that is not at all what we do today. We are enabling uh, researchers who have developed some of these products to optimize them and make them ready for clinical deployment. We may in the future also support that, but uh, frankly, that's a bit of a more well-trodden space and uh, not something that we are actively doing right now. And my final question to you is, you know, part of our mission in MedEvidence is to have physicians talk to one another and have people who are listening to the conversation glean some truths. So I'm curious to see how you perceive your background as a physician as something that's helped you in your current space. You, you mentioned to me off air that you're not currently practicing, but you've certainly practiced uh, extensively in the past. And tell us a little bit about how those clinical sensibilities, that training, uh, being a physician, how that's impacted your ability to be successful in your current role. There's a huge uh, kind of a big phenomena of a solution looking for a problem in tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been able to bridge better the solutions to an actual problem that a clinician decision maker would be making rather than something that kind of uh, sounds good. <laughs> and I think I've been better or well positioned to analyze the kind of uh, roadblocks and hurdles and the way of implementing that technology in a regulated uh, healthcare setting. Wow. That's, I love that answer. Thank you, Itai. This was a great conversation. Thank you for educating me. Um, sometimes it's kind of confusing hearing people talk about AI and, and how computers are going to revolutionize medicine. And you know, there is skepticism. Um, you, you alluded to that. And not all computerizations have been necessarily physician-friendly. But I have a better sense for what you're doing. Uh, keep up the good work. And thank you for being a guest on MedEvidence. Thank you very much for having me and for the stimulating conversation. Speak soon. Okay. Take care now. Thanks for joining the MedEvidence Podcast. To learn more, head over to medevidence.com or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform.